I'm going to meet the perfect guy and I'm going to get married. Charlotte York is a hopeless, old-fashioned romantic. But it can happen. People do live happily ever after. While the opening premise of Sex in the City is ostensibly that women don't need to be defined by traditional monogamous relationships, Charlotte acts as a foil to her three best friends by unabashedly dreaming of getting married, having children, and living out a classic ideal of romantic love. Sometimes you just know. With the right match, it's fate. On a show which initially seems to espouse a cynical view of love, this beacon of optimism acts as an important stand-in for many viewers who can to this day identify with her conventional desire for a perfect-looking fairy tale love. But if we look closer, much of the series is devoted to methodically disproving the various love myths that Charlotte believes in, like that finding your happily ever after means landing a perfect husband who will complete you. Everyone needs a man. That you'll be able to recognize this guy by his good looks or how much money he makes, and that you can only win him if you play by the rules. I thought you were serious about this guy. You can't sleep with him on the first date. Charlotte has to cure herself of her damaging romantic falsehoods. I, I want to believe, but nothing is happening, and I just don't think it's working. Before she can be ready to find the happiness she longs for. Meanwhile, witnessing this love re-education might help viewers pay attention to what unhealthy myths we too may need to let go of. Here's our take on how, by showing how Charlotte is wrong about everything to do with love, but still right to believe in it, Sex and the City guides us to a deeper understanding of what romance is really all about. I think that having it all really means having someone special to share it with. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell to be notified about all of our new videos. The Take is now on Snapchat. This month, in celebration of Halloween, we'll be releasing two episodes a week. Scan our snap code or search The Take on Snapchat to subscribe to our show and never miss an episode. Myth number one, you need a man to complete you. I believe that there's that one perfect person out there to complete you. Protagonist Carrie's three best friends in Sex and the City exist to embody divergent viewpoints. It's as if Samantha, Miranda, and Charlotte are three voices in Carrie's head debating and clashing over how the modern woman should approach life and love. Samantha believes the empowered woman has sex without attachment, showing a level of sexual liberation that was all but unprecedented on television at the time. You can bang your head against the wall and try and find a relationship, or you can say screw it and just go out and have sex like a man. Miranda, the feminist intellectual, believes a woman is empowered through independence and not making sex or romance the central mental focus of her life. How does it happen that four such smart women have nothing to talk about but boyfriends? Charlotte, on the other hand, represents that piece of the modern woman's soul who still clings to old-fashioned concepts of romance. Are you saying you're just gonna give up on love? She's been waiting her entire life for a knight in shining armor to sweep her off her feet and is convinced that she won't be complete until that happens. My life wasn't really complete until I met Trey. Her perspective aligns with the values embraced by so many romance stories that lead up to a perfect happily ever after. Women really just want to be rescued. But what's so disempowering about this belief that she won't be fulfilled until the one shows up is that it prevents Charlotte from feeling in control of her own destiny. Instead, she hands the keys of her happiness over to some dream person who may or may not materialize. Did you ever think that maybe we're the white knights and we're the ones that have to save ourselves? Despite her successful career and meaningful friendships, on some level, she feels that she's still waiting for her real life to start. I've been dating since I was 15. I'm exhausted. Where is he? One of the most important moments for Charlotte's character arc comes when she suggests that perhaps finding the perfect man isn't everything. Maybe we could be each other's soulmates. And then we could let men be just these great, nice guys to have fun with. While Charlotte must go through a lot of ups and downs and flawed relationships before she can live according to this principle, she has glimmers of insight throughout the series that show her gradually understanding that she must take responsibility to complete herself. Well, you better get interested, or you're gonna end up all alone and with no mans. Well, maybe I am. And would that be the worst thing that could happen? Myth number two, to win love, you have to play the game. Men don't want a woman who's too self-sufficient. When we first meet Charlotte in the pilot, she outlines a dating philosophy that doesn't shy away from manipulation in the search for true love. Most men are threatened by successful women. If you want to get these guys, you have to keep your mouth shut 
and play by the rules. Charlotte's outlook is inspired by The Rules, the time-tested secrets for capturing the heart of Mr. Right, a self-help book released in 1995 which aims to help women find a mate by essentially teaching them how to trick men into pursuing them. Much of its strategy is based on the assumptions that men like a woman who is hard to get. If you're serious about a guy, then you have to keep him in a holding pattern for at least five dates. And that modern dating life still boils down to the animalistic truth that men are the hunters and women are the prey. Throughout the series, Charlotte molds her personality to fit into this framework, attempting to appear elusive in order to always leave men wanting more. It's important to remain a creature of mystery. Some of Charlotte's rules about love are blatantly outlandish and weirdly specific. The number of dates that you wait to have sex with a man is directly proportional to your age. And the comic way they're presented encourages the audience to disagree with them, drawing our attention to the fact that no doubt we've heard or considered similar mantras in our own lives. It takes half the total time you went out with someone to get over them. Eventually though, Charlotte's life disproves all her rules. Decades of following them doesn't get her what she wants, but after she abandons all of them by sleeping with Harry before even starting a relationship with him, this leads her to a true love. I think I may be falling in love with you. I've been falling for you since the moment we met. Myth number three, men must see you as marriage material. In the early seasons of the show, Charlotte is overwhelmingly focused on how she is perceived by men. She believes that in order to find the perfect man, she must be seen as the perfect woman. It wasn't even a date. I didn't wash my hair and I wore my glasses. So she makes her own desires secondary in favor of crafting an image of herself as demure, desirable, and virtuous. In one episode, when considering a particular sexual act, she spends more time focusing on how her partner will judge her if she does it than on contemplating whether it's actually something she's interested in. I, I, I want to, but I can't. I, I, I mean, actually, no, that's not true. I don't want to, or maybe I do. I don't know what I want, but I'm afraid if I don't, then you'll dump me. Ultimately, her decision is made based on which choice she thinks will make her more marriageable. Men don't marry the up-the-butt girl. So it's only later in the series, once she lets herself focus on what she really wants, that Charlotte at last comes into her own. Myth number four, the right man must meet a strict, superficial criteria. One of the things that holds Charlotte back most is her focus on superficial external qualities in her search for a potential husband. Her dream man, her backup dream man. She believes that the only acceptable partner for her is wealthy, has a prestigious job, and is conventionally good looking. You fantasize a man with a Park Avenue apartment and a nice big stock portfolio. She also wants her future husband to come from a good family, with the subtext being that he needs to have had an upper class upbringing like she did. Honestly, I don't know how you can get serious with a guy whose entire future is based on tips. Even when she does meet a man who's expressly looking to get married and seems like a perfect match, she breaks up with him because they don't have the same taste in dinnerware. Charlotte broke it off then and there. It would never work. He was American classic, she was French country. This nitpicking is why the show eventually matches her with Harry, a man who is the exact opposite of everything she thought she wanted. He's so not my type. But perfect for her in every way. Harry's not who I expected to fall in love with, but I did. Myth number five, finding a husband requires a strategic plan. Marriage Incorporated, how to apply successful business strategies to finding a husband. In season three, Charlotte declares that this is the year she's getting married, despite the fact that she hasn't met the guy yet. Who's the lucky guy? Well, I don't know yet. This declaration reinforces that for her, marriage is less about forming a meaningful relationship than it is about achieving a milestone. Charlotte treated marriage like a sorority she was desperately hoping to pledge. The moment also marks a turning point. Because she's admitting that she cares more about the practical and social win of being married than about fulfilling her long-held fantasy about meeting the one, she decides that getting married requires a meticulous strategy. It encourages professional women to approach finding a mate with the same kind of dedication and organization that they bring to their careers. She even rejects her single friends and decides to surround herself with married couples so they'll connect her with eligible single men. But if you really want to get married, you shouldn't be spending so much time around dysfunctional single women. There is something positive about seeing the drive which has characterized Charlotte's professional life surface in her personal one. Instead of just waiting, she's demonstrating a will to take control of her future. You hear that, New York? I'm getting married this year! 
still, her belief that she can force fate's hand is misguided. In reality, she meets her most significant partners through chance, proving that real love appears on its own timeline. Myth number six, a relationship must follow a specific trajectory. When Charlotte meets Trey, she believes she has finally found the exact man she's been looking for since she was a teenager. Charlotte was spending all of her time with Trey, a doctor from Family Money who had it all. Not only does he meet her exacting criteria, but he also shows up via a classic romance movie meet-cute, enhancing her belief that their union is meant to be. And there was Charlotte, lying in the middle of the street. And that's how we met. She deems him the one after just a few weeks of dating. He could really be the one. Charlotte, honey, you've only known him for two weeks. You, you can know his email address. You cannot know he's the one. But Charlotte's fixation on her marriage plan backfires on her. She doesn't give herself time to really get to know Trey, so their relationship is founded only on flimsy external things in common. She loves that he comes from a good family, but finds that she loathes his snobby and overbearing mother. But I must tell you right now, I don't enjoy Mandarin food, and I don't enjoy a Mandarin child. Um, I don't think that's any of your business. Obsessed with becoming engaged as soon as possible, Charlotte gets fed up with waiting for a proposal and takes matters into her own hands. Maybe we should get married. Alrighty. But while she gets the outcome she desired, she's then horrified that the way it happened contradicts her fairy tale fantasy. I proposed to myself. She decides to lie about how the proposal took place. From that moment on, Charlotte would tell everyone that right in front of Tiffany's, out of nowhere, Trey popped the question, and she said, alrighty. Reinforcing the superficiality of this relationship, which has all along been mimicking an empty, preconceived formula instead of unfolding organically on its own. Myth number seven, you're either a Madonna or a whore. But I don't want to ruin it by having sex with him too early. Charlotte and Trey's lack of actual connection is expressed symbolically through their sex life. They agree not to have sex until their wedding night due to Charlotte's desire to perform the role of the pure, virginal Madonna for her husband. Nobody wants to marry a whore. Despite the fact that she's not actually a virgin. You know, I read that if you don't have sex for a year, you can actually become re-virginized. Sigmund Freud identified the Madonna whore complex as a problem of some men seeing women as either sexual whores or pious Madonnas, and thus being unable to desire partners they respect. This is exactly what we see happen when Trey deals with impotence. Trey can't get it up. Due to viewing his wife as a sexless Madonna. Trey sees you as his virginal wife, not his sexual plaything. You're not going to get anywhere until you change how he sees you. Eventually, Charlotte's dissatisfaction in her sexless marriage forces her to face her own repressed needs, which she's long been ignoring in order to craft her persona around what she thinks men want. I'm not a Madonna and I'm not a whore. I'm your wife and I'm sexual and I love you. Myth number eight, wife and motherhood require sacrificing selfhood. I'm quitting, that, that's what I wanna do, yep. I'm quitting. When Trey suggests that Charlotte quit her job to become a stay-at-home wife, I've been driving myself crazy lately, just trying to get everything done, and Trey suggested that- Trey suggested? Charlotte uses a superficial interpretation of feminism to try to back up her decision. The women's movement is supposed to be about choice. And if I choose to quit my job, that is my choice. But her clashing with Miranda, the most overtly feminist character on the show, makes it clear that Charlotte is working so hard to convince herself because it's not really the choice she wants. Stop to replace me and I really need you to get behind my choice. You get behind your choice. Charlotte's letting her preconceptions of the perfect domestic life supersede what her lived experience has proved actually makes her happy. You love your job. I know. She gives up that which provides her with a sense of self outside of her dreams of becoming a wife and mother. Also, I'm on the board of the Lenox Hill Pediatric AIDS Foundation. Charlotte heard herself lie. She just couldn't bring herself to tell the girl that her new resume objective would read wife, mother, and part-time bowl glazer. While Charlotte is right in theory that being a stay-at-home wife and mom isn't incompatible with feminist ideals, her commitment to old-fashioned conceptions of marriage and motherhood lead her to feel it's necessary to erase her individuality. When her marriage doesn't work out, Charlotte is left in a strange limbo. She's financially secure with the large perfect apartment, but without anything to do or any outlet for her skills and drive. And for the record, the only reason that I am volunteering is because no one will hire me. Of 
I've called seven galleries. Myth number nine, appearances are everything. Trey and I look like the perfect couple from the outside, but on the inside, it's all fake. Despite the fact that Charlotte and Trey's relationship rapidly crumbles throughout seasons three and four, she remains dedicated to keeping up the appearance of a happy marriage. Damn, we make a fine looking couple. She's devoted to making her marriage work not really out of love for Trey, but out of a refusal to accept that their reality doesn't match their picture perfect image and that their union was a mistake. Well, I was afraid you'd just say you told me so and then I should never have gotten married so quickly. By the time House and Garden magazine comes to do a feature on their home, the couple is separated and headed for divorce, but Charlotte still poses with him for the photo shoot rather than appearing in the piece alone as a single woman. This moment captures Charlotte's long-standing impulse to cling to the illusion of a perfect relationship even when the real thing doesn't exist. But all over America, little girls in their mother's pearls saw the picture and thought, that's what I want. All along, Charlotte's fatal love flaw is that she's so focused on the superficial signifiers of fairy tale romance that she ignores the real elements of a relationship which actually matter. My marriage is a fake Fendi. So when she finds herself drawn to her divorce lawyer, Harry, this attraction is a challenge to all of the love myths that have long governed her dating life. But he's bald and, and short. And he talks with his mouth full. Unlike Trey, who only looked good from the outside, Harry appears embarrassing in Charlotte's eyes. Nothing like her expectations for what her perfect man should be like. And I don't even want to be seen in public with him. And I hate his name, Harry, because he is everywhere but his head. But he's compassionate and challenges her, and they have a great time together. He makes me laugh. And he says what he means. And, and I feel like I can be myself around him. This time, she doesn't make him wait for sex in order to preserve some image of herself. But this far from dampens Harry's feelings for her, and she says it's the best sex she's ever had. It's the best sex of my life. I think I might really like him. Eventually, she even decides to convert to Judaism to be with Harry. I'm becoming a Jew. Demonstrating her willingness to move beyond the particular set of traditional values she's always based her life around. That night, Charlotte realized the memories she was giving up might be nothing compared to the memories she was getting. Still, Charlotte struggles to reconcile her genuine feelings with her lingering false love assumptions. Her old biases come back when she feels Harry's taking too long to propose to her. Do you know how lucky you are to have me? Do you know how we look? Do you know what people out there think when they see us together, do you? Once again, She's so eager to get engaged that she loses sight of the prerogative to nurture real love. In the end, though, her passion for Harry is what finally brings about the undoing of all Charlotte's damaging love myths. After Harry leaves her following her outburst, she comes to understand how little the superficial elements of a relationship really do matter to her. Harry was bald and he talked with his mouth full. But I loved him anyway. We can see how much she's changed when she rejects a handsome, Ivy League educated man who checks all her boxes. You're perfect, <laughs> but for where I am right now, you might as well be a gay man with carnations. And can't relate to other women she hears disparaging men for being fatties and baldies. All that's left is the fatties and the baldies. Charlotte could only hope that one of the baldies was her baldy. She even realizes that it's not necessary for her to get married to be happy in love. I don't care if you ever marry me. I just want to be with you. And when Charlotte and Harry do get married, their happy wedding, full of mishaps, is a clear juxtaposition to her perfect on the surface wedding to Trey, which was preceded by her realizing she had no intimate connection to her husband-to-be. You already had the perfect wedding and the marriage, not so perfect. You know, I think this is a good sign. I think the worse the wedding, the better the marriage. Near the end of the series, Charlotte's ideology about what it means to be a woman is challenged in an even more painful way through her struggles with infertility. 15% chance, 15% chance of ever having a baby. She has to confront her old fashioned assumptions about what motherhood must look like. And her happy ending in the series finale comes in seeing a picture of the baby girl she's going to adopt. That's her baby. It's a moment that's emblematic of the joy she experiences when she stops holding herself to a too rigid preconceived plan. It would be easy to assume that today's modern empowered woman is above many of Charlotte's outdated hangups and preconceptions, but her obsession with fairy tale love is as alive as ever in our culture today. You act like science when it's supposed to be some sort of fairy tale, but it's not. 
You're impossible to please. And our world of dating apps remains fixated as ever on the superficial. Ultimately, Charlotte endures as a relatable character due to what's both her most limiting flaw and her greatest strength, her romantic idealism. I'm afraid that he took away my ability to believe. And I hate him for that because I always believed before. While for a long time it holds her back through a restrictive vision of what her perfect life should look like, her undying belief in love also ensures that she never gives up. Charlotte's journey proves the words of Sufi poet Rumi. Your task is not to seek for love, but merely to seek and find all the barriers within yourself that you have built against it. As she breaks down the false myths about love that are in fact keeping her from being ready for real connection, Charlotte acts as a model for viewers who may be unknowingly serving their own bad relationship rules. So to this day, we can learn from Charlotte's resilient ability to keep hope alive while breaking down the barriers that are holding us back from finding true fulfillment. My good friend Charlotte, the eternal optimist, who always believes in love. This is The Take. What do you want our take on next?